does anybody, I was asked this because I really do like to give you the opportunity. Does anybody have something they'd like to share? Maybe some opportunity. God has allowed you over this last week. Um, I have to say, um, as a pastor and a person that gets to lead studies during the week, um, I'm encouraged. Um, I keep telling you guys this. I don't, please don't, please don't be too critical on me when I say this, but I'm really trying hard after after kind of having a certain teaching style, which is primarily just get up and lecture, which is a little harder to do something different in this situation here. I'm really trying to learn a little bit, make some adjustments, trying to learn a little bit from Ben. I really like the way Ben engages the class and asks questions to get you guys thinking about stuff. And uh, I try to do that. I'm not that great. I, a lot of times, you wouldn't believe it, but I sometimes on my study notes, I've got like questions in a, in a different color written on the side so I can plainly see them. And it's just like, I get going and it's like firing up that thing. And I just, and I go off and I get done. It's like, I had like five questions. So I didn't ask one of them. I got so focused on what I was teaching and uh, I missed those. Uh, I found if I try to come up with a question on the fly, it doesn't work so well. I have to kind of ask, think of questions in advance uh, to think. Uh, but having said that, um, the studies we've had this last week, I've enjoyed. I enjoy the participation. I like listening to the way other people are thinking through some of this stuff and uh, how they're operating, how they're processing. Uh, and because um, it helps me. We, it is, it is. I, I'm never, I'm never going to be bad, but I'm trying to learn to incorporate some of those things in what I'm doing. Um, I have to say this. That's a, this is, I'm not asking for anybody to answer this question right now. But what was our what was the big question on Thursday night's Bible study? Those of you that were there, you can't answer. I know because you and I talked about it. You and I talked about it afterwards, even a little bit more. See if see if our Bible study people remember. What was the, Our big question was from Ephesians 5, 18, because that's where we are. We're going through the book of Ephesians. Why does Paul at the first part of that say, do not be drunk with wine? What in the world is that all about? And why does he throw that in at that juncture? Because my wife's statement was pretty good. It just kind of seems like out of the blue, Paul just goes, oh, and don't be drunk with wine. Now let's go on and move on from there. And a lot, of, a lot of commentators look at it, it's just a contrast. So I'm not gonna give you an answer. I think, I think we kind of came to a consensus answer that I think, think, is, I think is somewhat accurate. I, I hope we're representing the word well. But you think about that process that, and maybe at another time we'll talk about that, but it was actually a really interesting study to think about um, why, he's, why he puts that in at that juncture. Did that spawn anybody else on to have something to share? Okay, if not, if not, let's have a word of prayer and we will dive into our new study. Our Father, we're thankful again for your word. We're thankful for every part of it, uh, even those parts that aren't directed specifically at our contact, conduct. They, they help us understand better who you are. They understand, help us understand better what you've done in the past. But then these parts that are specifically about where we are, we realize that they are certainly far more applicable. Uh, there's a much better chance we're going to find ourselves in these situations. And so help us as we pay attention to both of these things, that we might learn from them what you would have us. And we would thank you for it. Thankful for the spirit who dwells in us, who is the author of your word, that can help us to appreciate the things that are plainly written on the page. And we thank you for this. Then. Amen. So we today are starting a new study on the book of Titus. So you might want to find yourself 
find your place. We're going to be in a couple of other passages today on uh, with as we start into the book of Titus. So this is a time for you to actually maybe use that ribbon in your Bible if you have those. If you're like Stan and Dwight and some others that are following along, you just have that back button, right? So if you go to another passage, you just hit the back and it takes you back to Titus where you started. But uh, for some of us, I don't have a ribbon in this Bible, but I do have it in my, my other one that's here. Uh, so it's a good time for you to practice using that. Stick a piece of paper in there because we're going to be back to Titus several times. But I want to I want to begin just by reading the verses that uh, I trust that we can get through today. Uh, and so follow along with me. I'm reading from the New American Standard as normal, beginning with verse one of Titus one. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised long ages ago, but at the proper time has manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our savior to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God, the father in Christ Jesus, our savior. So as we're going to start into the book today, uh, we're not doing a fancy book introduction. We're taking Paul's introduction, and we're going to talk about some of the things in here. And the first things we're going to look at is that God has a plan. This book is about, and we're going to see this if you look down in verse 5, just to jump ahead. It says, for this reason, I left you in Crete that you might set in order what remains. So there's some things that Paul hadn't gotten to when he'd been on the island of Crete. We're going to have a little map I didn't put at the beginning, but we're going to look at it. Crete sits about 100 miles uh, south of Greece proper, somewhere between 80 and 100 miles south of Greece proper. It's not a very long island. I guess at its widest point, it's only 37 miles, but its narrowest point, it's like seven. You guys really want to know all those facts. That stuff fascinates me. I always, I'm sorry, I always think like the island that Josh and Faye are on. I was like, um, you know, could you actually run laps around that around that island? Well, I don't know if you could on theirs because it'd probably be a lot of rocks to crawl around on things like that. But anyway, back to Crete. It's it's a it's a island that's um, about a hundred miles long, about a hundred miles south of the coast of Greece. Just to kind of give you a perspective, some of you are going, "Oh, I remember Crete from geography." Maybe you don't. Crete, interestingly enough, was one of the first places that Paul. And Barnabas went on their first missionary journey. They sent out from Antioch and they actually go through Crete. And we can read about that over in the book of Acts. We're not going to be, do that because we're going to focus mostly on this text. But there were churches that were started, people that were evangelized, churches that were started. But as Paul is indicating here when he writes Titus, this is at a later point, a much later point in his earthly ministry. His trip to Crete was before 50 AD, probably. 47, 46, and he writes Titus around maybe 65 AD. So we're looking at almost 20 years between, in that span between the time that he writes these two things, or does has these two works, uh, the work over there and the work of sending Titus. So that brings us down to verse one, and we're going to look at the fact that God had a plan for Paul. Now, here's something I think it's important for all of us to notice as we go through this. God has a plan for all of us. And it's going to be for the same reason that he had a plan for Paul. It may not be the same plan he had for Paul, but he does have a plan for us as believers. Okay. Um, uh, Campus Crusade, when I was growing up, crew today, they used to pass out a track called the Four Spiritual Laws. And it actually has a wrong statement as one of their opening premises. And that says, God has a plan for you, or maybe God has a wonderful plan for you. Maybe you've seen track, but the thing is, you know what? I don't know that God has a plan for you. If you're an unsaved person, I'm sharing the gospel. I'd say God could have a plan for you. Maybe God has a plan for you. If you're a believer, if you don't believe in the gospel, guess what? Then that plan that God has, that God would have, that plan is not a wonderful plan. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then God has a plan for you, and he had a plan for Paul. And so the opening thing he says is, Paul, a New American Standard says, a bond slave. It's simply the word slave, a doulos. So they've tried to make a distinction here. They have this idea of this bond slave, one that has come and has allowed his master, as they say, to, to, to put a punch in his ear. They draw, they draw this out of an Old Testament example. But this word doulos just means slave. There's nothing special about this term. 
This was used to people that were held as slaves to masters and they hadn't willingly become slaves. But having said that, when we talk about being a slave, and I didn't give you scriptures on the outline here, but Paul's a slave willingly. And I want to look at a couple of verses that I don't, I, like I said, I didn't give to you here, but I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, and Peter is addressing elders. That is people that are mature and people that are gifted to serve as bishops and or shepherds in this context. And he says in verse 2, as he's talking to them, he says, shepherd, this is 1 Peter 5 verse 2, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion. That is, it's not because somebody has pressed it upon you and made it necessary. If you become a pastor because somebody has pushed you and you go, you got to go into ministry. We, we had a, a, a family in the church that, well, I only went to church there for a couple of years, but uh, at the end of my high school, we were in this church and there we were praying all the time for this couple because they were going to Brazil, I believe it was. South America someplace. I'm Brazil's easy because it's a big target to hit, you know, so I'm going to say Brazil, but it may not have been, but they were going. And the mother-in-law of the, the man was always pray for them, pray for them, pray for them, and that they get down there and they raise their support and they finally got down there and they were on the mission field a little less than a year total. And they came home because he went into a spiraling thing of frustration, of, of fear and depression. And it was really interesting because we didn't know anything about this. This had all started before we ever started attending that church. And what we ended up finding out was everybody goes, well, they didn't go willingly. And we're, you're like, what? They went because the mother-in-law, the daughter's, the, the wife's mother was absolutely convinced the ultimate way to serve God is to be a missionary. And so her daughter had gone off to Bible college. And I remember they took our youth group. They took us, our youth group. Uh, canoeing once and they took every one of it they took every one of us high school kids along or aside individually at a given time and they said we just we're not saying you have to do this but you should think about going to bible college for at least one year even if you're going to go no matter what else you do in life you should go to one bible college before you do anything else in life to help get you ready and second of all and you really ought to consider seriously becoming a missionary <laughs> and and the thing is, you have to be you have to be directed clearly by God to go into this. And so th these people came back because they were doing somebody else's will. It was pushed upon them, pressed upon them by somebody else. Don't ever let anybody press you into service here or any place else. If I get you to do service that I think you ought to do, then you're doing what I think you ought to do. And maybe is it maybe the right thing? Maybe the right thing. But if you're doing it, you better do it because you know it's what God wants you to do. Not because Tim or your parents or your kids or whoever else, your spouse, whatever it might be, has pressed you into this service. You need to do it because you know what God wants. And so he says, not a compulsion, but voluntarily do this. So it ought to be something that you do willingly. If you serve, you should serve willingly. He does add one other thing there. Don't do it for sordid gain. But we're not going to talk about that at the moment. We'll come back to that in another day. Turn over to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, in chapter 10, 1 or 1 Corinthians chapter 9, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is Paul speaking about himself. He says, for if I preach the gospel, oh, verse, oh, verse 16, 1 Corinthians 9, 16, I apologize. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing then to boast in, for he says, necessity is laid on me, for woe is to me if I don't preach the gospel. Now, <laughs> is Paul or is it Peter? Peter says, don't do it out of necessity. Same word, by the way. And Paul says, necessity is laid upon me. But notice what he goes on to say. For if I do this willingly, then I have a reward. If it's unwilling, well, a, a stewardship has been committed to him. And Paul had been chosen by God and given a stewardship a management that was given to him. Paul's situation was a little bit different, but he is doing this willingly because he says in verse 18, what therefore is my reward? In order that preaching the gospel without charge, 
I may then announce these good tidings so as not to make full use of my authority in the gospel. So as Paul's looking at this, Paul says, I'm, I, even though this has been given to me as a stewardship, as a management, Paul says, I still am doing it willingly. I'm not doing it. He says, yeah, the necessity is laid on me, but I'm balancing it because he says, I'm still doing this willingly. This is what I want to do. It's what I want to do. And so I just say that as we start this off here, and Titus talks about being a bond slave, that Paul, and this is true of you, you can be a slave of God, but you do so willingly. This is the way God, God doesn't want to throw us into bonds, put a chain around our neck and lead us around like that. He wants us to come to him and say, hey, you're the one that paid for me. You bought me. I belong to you. What do you want me to do? This is about you. And so Paul looks that, and this is significant. And Paul uses this, by the way, as an example, when he goes to Philippians, writes to them that he can look at Christ. He looks at himself. He looks at Timothy. He looks at Epaphroditus as examples of the proper attitude for serving. And when you serve in this way, it's not about doing, or it was about doing God's will, not his own will. And think about how often we make choices in life that it's about what we want to do. And we try to fit God's will into those places. Do we do that sometimes? Do we, do you ever, do you ever try to fit God's will into doing the things you most want to do? I've got these aspirations. I want to go to Switzerland. I don't. <laughs> I want to go to Switzerland and I want to climb what's I think it's called the spider, <laughs> this big mountain. I, again, I don't, this is not what I want, but I remember reading about this and boy this is a big aspiration that people have but i could have all kinds of aspirations i i grew up when i was saying i always want to go to europe i want to go to europe i want to europe and you know what I, as time's gone on i'm like i don't care if i ever go to europe because you know what if that's not what god wants me to waste my time doing well, <laughs> if that's not what god wants me to do then i probably ought not to do that i ought to be going what does god want me to take my time and do see and so you're able to kind of rein in and say, what does God want me to be doing? But you, but the thing is, God's not going to grab you by the neck and force you to do these things. So when Paul says he's a slave of God, first thing to understand is he's doing this willingly. But being a slave, he's doing then God's will, not pursuing his own. That's the whole idea of being a slave. And it's something that you that you're doing. And this is not scripture. This is not scripture, but it's an I think it's a, a, a accurate observation of what the word of God says. And this is a statement from Lewis Berry Chafer. I hear Kevin Jeffries quotes this a lot when I listen to him. And he makes a statement in his book, Grace. Grace makes all service voluntary. If you're really living by grace, then whatever you do, however you serve, it ought to be something that you're always voluntarily doing. Nobody's strong arming you into it. If somebody has to strong arm you, I don't care what level, what degree, what kind of service, whatever it is, if you are serving and you're doing it because somebody else has pressured you into it, then you ought to just quit. Quit doing that service, get your attitude adjusted. Maybe God wants you to do that service, but adjust your attitude. Or maybe you're doing something and it really isn't what God wants you to do. That's a tough thing for us to realize that sometimes our Christian service it's not what God wants us to do. And it's not, it may not even be bad Christian service. It's just not what he wants us to do. He maybe has other areas he would like to fill your life with, but you just can't let go of what you think you're supposed to do. I was waiting for Clinton here. Okay. He's going to stay. I was just thinking maybe state Clinton's going to go, oh, Tim strong armed me into running this stuff down here. I, I don't think God wants me. He's going to get up and walk away, but he's going to stick with us. Okay. Anyway. Then he goes on to the next statement here. He says, not only a slave of God, but an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, the word apostle means one that is sent and specifically had the idea of being one sent on a mission. In fact, in Latin, this word apostolos is translated by the word mission. That's where we get missionaries. So technically, we don't have missionaries today, believe it or not, because we don't have apostles today. We have people that have gone abroad but they have other gifts because they're not gifted as apostles in the technical biblical sense. 
but we use the word missionary and we're not going to change <laughs> we're not going to change that are we we're not going to go change the whole vocabulary set people you know, we have to come up with a different word but he says he's also an apostle of jesus christ and this likewise we understand this has to do with being sent on a mission if somebody sends you on a mission are you going on that mission to do what you want or are you going to do the, the mission that you were sent to complete yeah it's which is a really important thing um kenya last week was talking to us about um uh the youth group and that they go on a mission trip and it just it spawned my mind that uh um i i read this i don't know five or six years ago but there was a missionary and interesting enough did you say mexico okay this was a missionary from mexico and i don't remember what mission agency they were with but this missionary down in in mexico had written this blog and said i don't know what to do with mission trips because every year he says we get these mission trips from churches in the united states they come down here and they want to serve but what they do is they run a vbs program and none of the kids can understand it because they can't understand when the kids are up there using a tape and they're doing puppet shows and stuff like that because they're speaking in english and the people speak spanish and they have no clue as to what it's about and he says they come and do that and then they always want to do a project and he says we've got like three houses connected with our church and those houses have like 20 20 coats of paint on them i'm probably exaggerating because every year a mission group comes out and paints one of them goes back to the states and said we painted this church and he says it's just because we're trying to find something for him to do but then he says this is the other part and almost every one of those mission trips comes and it's kind of part vacation too so you're going to go on this mission trip but they always want to have like a few days where you plan some activity for them to go off and have some fun and tour the country and he goes i've got stuff to do <laughs> i'm busy as a missionary and now all of a sudden i've become a a tour or what do you call it, a travel agent for these people now i'm not saying mission i'm not saying all mission teams and all that is bad I'm just trying to put this in perspective that if you really think God wants you to go, then you ought to go and be doing that work. You're not going there to get to know another part of the world. You're going there to be reaching people, to be helping people. And so the apostle Paul says this, let's take a look over in the book of Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians chapter four. Look at me in Ephesians chapter four in verse seven. Ephesians 4 verse 7, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of the gift from Christ. We're going to skip over the statements in between, and it says in verse 11, and he gave some, so here's the gifts, he gave some apostles, and others that were prophets, others evangelists, and others shepherd teachers. So Christ, he gave gifts to people. And these are four of the gifts that he gives. Some people think there's a list of five here, but I think there's four. I think shepherd and teachers are the same. And he says that these gifts actually have his purpose. It's not just for, hey, I'm a pastor. What does a pastor do? Well, you guys tell me what a pastor does. No, the word of God tells me what a pastor is supposed to do. We don't know that in modern churches. Churches look for pastors and the church comes up with what should a path, what do you want a pastor to be? And they they, they survey the people and the people say, well, we want this and we want this and we want this and we want this and a pastor. And if you held up those qualifications and examined the word of God, you could say, okay, that's biblical. That's good. But what in the world is that? He makes Kool-Aid really? Well, no, it doesn't say it. But you know what I'm saying? They have things about that ridiculous things that they want from pastors, things they expect. And he says the purpose of these gifts, here's, here's the purpose of these gifts, verse 12. Those, those gifts are for the equipping of the saints. What's one of what's what the purpose? You you guys have at least at least four guys in the church that on a regular basis share in, in teaching in varying degrees. Myself and Jim and Josh and Ben. And when we're carrying out this, whether we're completely filling the office of shepherd teacher, doing these kind of things, guess what? part of our purpose is to equip or outfit the the saints for the work of service and that word equip we pick on ben chris those two guys have both gone up mount rainier and i can guarantee you from talking with them you don't go up mount rainier and say well i got my sneakers on it's a hot day so i'm gonna wear my shorts who i'm gonna wear i better wear a long sleeve shirt so i don't get sunburned 
and I probably should take along a bottle of water. Oh, and a granola bar. Let's go. <laughs> if you guys know anything about going up Rainier, which I don't, I only vicariously live this through listening to Chris and, and Ben talk about, did you go up Rainier once? And, and can you hear? Um, you, you have to be equipped, don't you? You have to be outfitted. There's appropriate things to take. In fact, there's things that they have to teach you before you even get started, before you put your first foot to the ground and actually head up the real ascent. There's things you need to know. And he says, and that word that he uses here, equip, that's what that, one of the uses of that word in scripture is the equipping of a person for that kind of a task. And he says, these gifts are given for the equipping of the saints. Therefore, an encouragement to you on, as an aside, while we're directing this at the role of shepherd teachers, evangelists, prophets, and apostles, notice how I work backwards there from kind of us there, one of the things for you to do is that when you're in church, whether you're here or at church someplace else, is you need to avail yourself. You need to take advantage of the people that are really trying to teach you the word of God. You also need to be listening to what they teach and hold it up to the word of God and say, okay, maybe they're using their Bible, but is that really square with what the Bible actually says? That is something you need to do, but you need to take advantage of this because this is helping equip you to, what does he say then in verse 12, for not the work of service, but a work of service. Your job is not my job. You have the gift of encouragement. You need to be trained in the word of God so that you can encourage people well. How do you encourage people to put things into practice if you haven't ever listened to what's taught? You might be encouraging people with completely the wrong information. How do a person suffering and you have the gift of mercy? How do you show mercy? How do you help a person that's going through suffering in their life if you don't know from the word of God what the word of God actually gives you to be sympathetic and to actually in a right way suffer with those people and help them. Get the idea? Even serving, even serving in broad capacities, helping people in other ways. You can serve with the wrong attitude, you can serve with the right attitude, but all of this comes back to the fact that these men are given to equip you so that you can go on and do what God has given to you. By the way, that implies every one of you has a gift from God, just as he said back in verse 7, which means God's given you a gift, and he wants you to use that gift. He wants you to serve in your, among believers, I'd say in your local assembly, but God might use you to serve in more than one place sometimes, because you might meet with other believers. There's some of us guys that get together with guys from other churches on Monday and Tuesday nights. They don't attend church here. Does that mean, well, you don't attend church here. Stan goes to a Bible study with a bunch of men that come from, what, four or five different churches, maybe? Yeah. And Stan can go there, and can, God can use Stan to be of help to those other guys, even though they may be in other places. So it's he's given you an ability to serve, and you need to be seriously thinking about, how does God want me to be serving these other people and taking advantage uh, of this idea. So you're an apostle sent on a mission by Christ. This is what Paul's saying about himself. And he was sent to equip saints for their work. Now, when Paul does that, he's going to explain this to the last part of it. His mission is to help believers learn to live by faith. Notice back in Titus chapter one, Titus chapter one. You ever, you ever tried to flip through a page and you don't want to go too aggressive because you don't want to flip through a whole book and you're stuck and that one page won't let go of your thumb or your thumb won't, that was just happening to me there. But Titus chapter one, verse one, it says, Paul is slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then it says in the, in the New American Standard, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of truth, which is according to godliness. Now, that expression that's translated for the faith of Joe's chosen of God, that word for in the Greek is a word kata, which means to come down on and has the idea of a measurement or a standard. So Paul is saying the standard of my apostleship, the measurement of that is the faith of God's chosen ones or God's elect. And the standard of that 
is knowledge of truth. And what does he mean by those two things? He says, if I'm doing my job, it ought to be helping people. So this is, I think, why the New American Standard translates it for, but it ought to be helping people understand how to live by faith. It ought to be teaching people God's promises. Did you know we, we, already, we already gave you one promise today? At least one? We just made reference to it just not only a minute or two ago out of Ephesians 4. You've all been given a gift. Doesn't, isn't there a promise embedded in that? If he gave you a gift, doesn't that mean that he has a way for you to serve? He has a way for you to serve other believers. Of course, that implies you are engaged with other believers so that you can be serving them. A lot of times people go, I don't know how to serve. Well, are you engaged with other believers? A lot of times when you're engaged with other believers, you're going to, a lot of times you're going to see certain needs that maybe I miss or somebody else misses. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as you're engaged with them, then you're going to, you'll be addressing those things. Even if you, and you're using your gift, you don't even know that you're using your gift. Until you're talking to somebody someday and somebody goes, oh, you know, boy, I really appreciate how God uses you this way or that way. And these other people, and you're going, ah, see other people recognize you using your gift sometimes before you realize what it is. But he says, it's the, the faith of God's chosen one. So it, that has the idea of teaching people what faith is, how to use faith biblically, and what the promises are in which you have faith. And this is what Paul was doing. Because, and Jim made a really nice contrast in his class downstairs this morning between the world system for us and the world system with regard to Israel. Why does God not in the Old Testament tell Israel, don't love the world system? Like, jo like John has to tell us. <clears throat> because what was one of the things that is, that is promised, we're sold this today in the world system? Prosperity. prosperity. And your know, prosperity is all kinds of, there's all kinds of things. The world system holds out promises of prosperity. I mean, I think it's still doing this, but I know like when Peg and I were in high school, we were like, oh, don't become a mechanic. Don't become a carpenter. Don't settle for checking out groceries at the grocery store. Go off to college and you can become successful. And you can essentially, they don't advertise it like this, but essentially they're trying to tell you, then you can have the big job with the big bucks. Isn't that kind of what the world tries to sell with the whole college model? You know, there's a lot of college students says, oh, I didn't know that that big job with the big bucks means that I owe big bucks. Because <laughs> that way some of it do it. Anyway, back to the main point here. That, that when we're talking about that, the world system promises prosperity. And so we need to teach promises that are unique to you and I. You and I have no promises that tell us that we can go up against a Goliath. We have no promises that God is going to deliver some really big dude into my hands, and I'm not going to get pummeled by him. Did Paul get pummeled several times in his life? Yes, he did. Because God had no promises that he gave to Paul or any of us that he's going to rescue us out of hands that are, of guys that are bigger. But what did David say when Goliath's standing there? He says, this is what you come out against me? Like dogs? This is what it is? And he says, I'm going to hand yourself back to you. And, and David goes, you have defied the name of the Lord God of Israel. And God will give you into my hand. Because... Well, David was standing up for the honor of God in that. And did God ever, did, did Dan, or excuse me, did David have a promise in that? I don't know if David had that promise, but I think you could go back to the law and you could say that God said, you know what? When you get people that aren't doing things right, you're doing the right thing. That enemy can come out against you one way and they will flee in seven directions. <laughs> and who is David? Apparently not that impressive of a warrior because he couldn't even wear couldn't even put on Saul's armor to go up against him. All that to say, we've got different sets of promises. We've got promises that we can go through hardship and adversity and bear up underneath it and even grow through it rather than having to pummel adversity and put it in its place. Well, we can keep going through it. In fact, Paul's life, did Paul's life end facing adversity? Yeah, he ended up on death row. 
And the last act that the world system ever did to him, according to scripture, or according, excuse me, according to history, is that they brought a sword of a Roman soldier on his neck and took his head off. And Paul goes, it's the last, last bad thing they'll ever do to me. I'm gone, but I just got advanced. And so Paul says here, part of the measurement of his, the standard of his apostleship was, what's he say there? The faith of God's elect. So going back to this model of what, as, as he's laying this out, and this is, believe me, this is actually really important for where Paul is going in his letter to Titus, which we're not even going to get there today, where it's going to be a couple weeks at least before we get to that part. But essentially, one of the things you want in leaders in your church are people that know the difference between the promises that God made to them and the promises God's made to you. If they don't understand that, that's not going to help you. They're going to set you up for, for frustration and failure. Then he goes on, not only the faith of God's chosen or God's elect, but also the knowledge of truth. Is there a lot of truth that God's revealed to us that he didn't reveal in the Old Testament? Yes. If the Old Testament was sufficient, then what do we have the rest of this for? I honestly have... We, I, we, I, we had somebody else, I think like the first year that we were here, first year that we were here, we had somebody else that had taught occasionally in the church uh, before I arrived, and that was fine. And I, I didn't want to be teaching all the time. So I said, hey, would you like to teach the adult class? And this person says, sure, I will do this. And I don't know how long I did, but the person did a study on the book of Proverbs. And I don't have a problem with a person doing a study on the book of Proverbs, but I still remember like the opening comments on the book of Proverbs. In the opening proverb, the opening comment in the book of Proverbs, much to my dismay, as a new pastor that had only been here maybe seven or eight months at that time, was if we had no other book of the Bible but the book of Proverbs, we would have more than enough to live life. And I'm thinking, what? Then why did God waste all that ink on the rest of Scripture? And there's all kinds of people that are teaching today that the Old Testament was the church's Bible, and it wasn't. If it was their Bible, then why did you have all these letters written to the churches? Because we needed additional revelation. Keep your finger in Titus or your ribbon or whatever and turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And uh, let's go down to verse 24. Colossians chapter 1 and verse, uh, just trying to make sure I have the, have the right verse here. Yes, okay, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in the afflictions of the Christ. In other words, he realizes not all believers are suffering to the degree I am. And Paul, rather than going, that's not fair. It's not fair, God. Why do I have to suffer more than that? Paul says, I rejoice. If I suffer a little bit more, then maybe these people can suffer a little less. I'm okay with that. But then he goes on uh, in verse 25, of which then, that is of the church at the end of this, of which then I have become a minister according to the dispensation or the stewardship from God given to me for you. He tells us that over in Ephesians, doesn't he? The dispensation of the grace from God was given to me, but it was for you. It wasn't given for Paul to squander. And then he goes on, and this is the way the New American Standard reads it, that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That's not what it says. What it literally says is that I might fill up the word of God. What does he mean by that? It means that God had not said everything that needed to be said. And one of the purposes that Paul had was actually writing more scripture, that God had more to say, things to say to us. That's why we have the letters of Paul. That's why we have James. That's why we have the letters of Peter and of John and Jude. We have those other letters because there was more that God needed said, wanted said for you and I. 
if you've got a struggle on a problem and understanding something, where do we normally go first? To the letters written to the church. I don't normally turn first to Matthew. I don't normally turn to the book of Ezekiel or to Jeremiah. It's not saying that, that there might not be something in there that God might use to encourage me, but largely the scriptures are going to tell me how I'm supposed to respond and how I'm supposed to think are written in the letters that are given to the church. And Paul says, that was part of my job. That was part of my stewardship. My management was actually filling that up because God had not said everything that he wanted to say. Now take your Bibles and flip to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. We've gone over this a lot, but I want you to look with me as verse 3, Paul says, I urged you, talking to Timothy, upon my departure from Macedonia to stay on in Ephesus in order that you might instruct certain ones not to teach differently. Differently than what? Well, than Paul had taught, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. In other words, apparently people trying to prove that they were genetically Jews, that they legitimately had a right to the Jewish promises. And these only give rise to debates rather than, the, so they, they, they get people focused on the wrong thing rather than the dispensation from God, which is by faith. In other words, our house rule today is faith. Well, it's by faith, excuse me. Our house rule is grace, but that grace is by faith because God's made us promises by grace. Walk by the Spirit, and you will fulfill the lust from the flesh. That's a promise of grace where he has extended a status, a position to you in Christ. And if you relate to that, set your mind to that, you can actually experience freedom. Right? Regardless of your genealogy. Yeah, a Jew doesn't have a better, it doesn't have a foot. You don't have to wait in line. I keep trying to get on the escalator to go up to my position in Christ, and I, the Jews keep bumping me aside. No, we get first. No, it's not like that. We all come to this position. So it is all by faith. Then he goes on in verse 5. But the goal or the purpose of our charge is love from a pure heart. See, Christ gave us a command to love one another, and it's love from a pure heart, love from a good conscience, and love from an unhypocritical faith. But some, verse 6, are straying aside from these. They've turned aside to fruitless discussions. They want to be teachers of the law, even though they don't understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they're making confident assertions. In other words, these people really don't know the law. If they really, really read the law for what it says, they go, wait a second, that is not at all the way we live. And so Paul is concerned that these people living by grace knew what it was to live by faith. As opposed to, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, as opposed to living by sight. Just ask yourself, because I think if you're like me, you probably struggle with this. How often do you make decisions based on sight? Here's the pro column. Here's the, oh, here's the no column. Oh, man, there's more sheet stuff. You ever feel like that? That when you see clearly something God wants you to do, if you did a pro and con worksheet, the cons seem to outnumber sometimes the pros for what you think God wants you to do. Because we don't operate by sight. And sorry, people, I, I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here. But I didn't, have, I didn't have a list of pros that outnumbered a list of cons for coming to Royal City. I didn't have them. But was this where God wanted us to be? And I've told you the story. God convinced me and my wife in different parts of the church on the very same day. And you need to walk by faith in the promises of God. Not by sight. Not by lists of pros and cons. How were you acting today? How was I acting the day we moved? I was, I was pretty dang afraid. I was actually leaving everything I was very familiar with, living what I considered a semi-safe environment, moving to the wild, wild west. 
No, I'm talking about the Wild West with guys that got hidden guns and crazy mechanics. Do you ever watch that TV show? You know, <laughs> James Bond in the 18 in the late 1800s. Yeah, that's what I figured. No, I just I, seriously. I, this is the way my mom put it. God's it's gonna be like Moses. God's gonna take you to the backside of the desert for 40 years. So you guys got us for nine more, I guess. <laughs> uh, but no, she goes, and then and you know what? I, she doesn't say that anymore. But early on, and I had a, I remember sitting grilling hamburgers for a missionary that was visiting us that came through here was speaking at the church, and he goes, just be faithful. I'm sure he says, if you're faithful here for another year or two, God will move you on to better things. <laughs> See? Because that's the way we look at it. If you look at it by sight, people look at this and go, this isn't better. Isn't that great? This is where pastors come in and get their feet wet. This is the waiting pool. And then you move up to the next church, which is the kind of the pool where the water is deep enough. You can actually kind of, have you ever tried to swim in a wading pool? Maybe if you're a little, little kid, you can get it deep enough that you can bob in it. But there's no way that there's enough water to boy, or, you know, hold me up. Anyway, so on with this, this idea. We live by faith to live by grace. Okay, I'm sorry, I kind of ran off, chased a little bit of a rabbit trail. But the next thing he says, if you go back there to Titus chapter 1. The next thing back there in Titus chapter one that he says that that knowledge then this knowledge is according to on our English Bibles have the word godliness okay don't don't make Jim and myself feel bad here what would be a better way to maybe represent that word godliness say it again It'll stand real loud God honoring God honoring yeah it's a way of life that honors God well. This is what this is all about. And so it's a way of life. And in simple terms, in a nutshell, because I'm not here to develop this particular statement about godliness, we maybe we'll do that when we get over to chapter two. But godliness, the way you honor God well, is you use what he has given you well. And I don't mean by that, well, he gave me a house, use it well. He gave me a car, use that. What's the, I'm not saying you can't use those things well. But I would say, notice the next statement, it's godliness that is literally in the, in the, uh, in the Greek, it says in the hope of eternal life. Literally, it is upon, it rests upon a hope that comes from eternal life. God has given you, if you're a believer in Christ, you have eternal life. When I was a little kid at five years old, after I believed in Jesus Christ, if you would have asked me what, what I had, because I believe in Christ, I would have said, I'm forgiven, my sins are forgiven, and I have eternal life. Now, forgiveness of sins, I think I got that. To say I had eternal life, I didn't really know what that meant. I probably would have said, well, I get to live forever, because I didn't really know what eternal life was. I may not even been able to get that much out, but I knew I had eternal life. That was something that was always good. But the thing is, God intends you to use eternal life, doesn't he? He just didn't give you eternal life to fold it up and stick it in your back pocket. He expects you to lay hold of that eternal life, to make use of it every day. And when you use eternal life the way God wants you to use it, that honors him well. I don't know, five or six years ago, um, my, pa or my, my pastor, my parents' pastor, their son was going for treatment. Uh, to Iowa City, which is a three-hour drive, I think, from where they live. And he was having to go every week for these treatments. And they had, their, their family was continuing to grow, and they're in two kind of older cars that aren't doing all that well. And uh, there's a young guy in their church, about, I'm going to guess, 24, 25. He's a mechanic in the next town over. And Kyle, Kyle goes to his dad, and he says, I, I think I'd like to talk to the board. And so he talks to the board. He says, you know what? The pastor shouldn't be having to do this. And he says, I went over to the Dodge dealer over in Mason City, and they've got two vans, like just like the vans at the Garnick Star. That van, they have one like that. He said, they got two of them over there, a white one and another gray one or something. I think that the church ought to buy one of those for him. Let him go over and pick out either one he wants. And that's what they did. So you know what Ben and Stacy did? They took that van, they brought it home, and they parked it in the garage. And every day, <sighs> he'd go out and polish it. He'd go in there, he'd dust it. But they never drove that because what a beautiful gift. Don't mess that thing up. Just leave it. Would that be honoring to the gift that the church did? No. You know what Ben did? 
Their whole family could travel now down to Iowa City for treatment. They could all go down there and stay at the Ronald McDonald House. They could all pile in that, make that three-hour trip together. They used that gift well to this day. I thought it got damaged a couple of weeks ago, but it was because they hit something on the road on their trip out to New York and they punctured a tire, blew a tire out of the road by hitting something on the road. And you know what? Just down the road from them were some people that they knew that were believers. They didn't even know these people were there. They had just moved in the area and they were able to take care of them, get the tire fixed <laughs> out in the middle of the road. It sounded like the whole vehicle had gone up, but no, it was just a tire that blew out. You use well what God's given to you. And so God's given you eternal life. And he wants you to use that well, and that honors him. And he says then, in the next part of this, he says he promised this eternal life. And he's a God, by the way, he doesn't lie. So if he makes a promise, you know, have you ever told somebody something and then somebody comes back and say, hey, you were telling me about, and you're going, did I really, we talked about this? That has happened to me. <laughs> but sometimes it's like somebody comes, hey, you were telling me, and you're like, no, now you want to cash in on that? Oh, you know, but you're not doing that. You're like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, I don't want to, I don't want to do that right now. That was okay when I talked to you about that six months ago. Anybody, you're the only person that's ever, am I the only person that's ever been in that? Okay. Let's see. And so, but God doesn't lie. So if God says it, he's going to stand behind it. And God's promise here was eternal life. And he says he made that promise long ages ago. Literally, he did it in times from eternities, way back there before the clock started rolling, come out of eternity, way back before the, when, does it, when did the clock start ticking? When he created the universe, because the universe is where time is. And so when he does that, there's, shall we say, a clock. There's not really a clock, but you know what I mean. That's when you start measuring time. And he says, he did that long ago, way back then, but verse three, but at the proper time, he made it plainly visible. This is interesting because Paul or Peter tells us something similar. From God's point of view, Jesus Christ was a lamb slain way back there in eternity, but it's only something that has been recently made known. And likewise, Paul is telling us here, God made the promise of eternal life way back there, but it's only been made visible now. That's what we just got done studying in Hebrews 13. That's called the eternal covenant. The promise wasn't he promised me eternal life. It was that he promised the son that not the son would have eternal life, but that you and I would have eternal life because of the son. We just got done looking at that. We're not going to do that. But he's made it visible now. This is, again, without ever using the word dispensation or mystery, this is actually biblical truth. And this is why Paul calls mist or call in 1 Timothy 3, why he calls godliness or a God-honoring way of life, why he calls it a mystery, because it wasn't plainly revealed that people would have eternal life and were able to use it to honor God well. And Paul says at the end of this, this it, it's made known there by a proclamation with which I've been entrusted according to the command or the order of, we have this next expression, this message is entrusted to Paul, He's the one that talks to us about how to live by faith. And when we live by faith, we're able to live out this knowledge, spiritual knowledge, just not head knowledge, not just we sat in a Bible study and took a bunch of notes. And Tim's been giving us these for years and I've got it. I've got more of these than I know what to do with. No, we're talking about that you actually live it out and you go, wait a second. That's what God's love looks like. I read about Jesus laying down his life. But I just experienced it because I just experienced what it was like to really lay down my life for somebody else rather than doing what I want to do. And by the way, at the time, I really did want to lay my life down for that person because your attitude gets adjusted in the process, doesn't it? And Paul says that was experiential knowledge and not just experiential knowledge, but full experiential knowledge. And so as he's putting all this together, what Paul says is, I'm an apostle. I'm a slave of God, and I'm an apostle, and the purpose of my apostleship is to help you people. I'm not the apostle. I'm Paul, pretending to be Paul. My is to help you understand how to live by faith, what the promises are, and how to use eternal life to honor God well. And it's not something that's been around for a long time. He says it's something that is recent. It's only now, recently, been committed to me. 
and I, Paul says, am sharing it. So here's Paul. This is his, the way he's introducing himself. And he goes on, he says, it's been, done to, it's been entrusted to me by the commandment or the order of God our Savior or our Savior God. And it's a reference to Jesus Christ. We're going to look at others of, other examples of this in, as we go through the study, but he uses this expression four times in, in Titus, and every one of them is a reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you just one of them here at the moment. Chapter 2, look at me at verse 13. And this doesn't call him just strictly Savior God, but it's notice what he says, how he puts it together, undoubtedly. This is one of the things grace does. Grace teaches us to be eagerly expecting the happy hope, even the appearing of the glory of our great God, even Savior Christ Jesus. Jesus is our great God, <coughs> even our Savior. And he says that's a happy hope for him to appear and us to see him. Now, the last thing that we want to look at before we leave today is he writes this to Titus. I'm just going to hit these things very quickly. The first thing he says back in Titus chapter 1 and verse 4, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm now giving this instruction. I'm passing this on to you, to Titus, my true child in common faith. That expression, common faith, is really important. Is it? Have you ever sometimes looked, read the New Testament and go, there's no way I could ever be Paul. There's no way I could have the faith that Paul had. There's no way I could have the faith like Peter demonstrated. But you know what? He says it's common faith. In fact, Peter's the one that tells us in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, you guys obtain a faith that is equally precious or equally valuable to, implying ours. All of us as believers have had that same kind of faith. That doesn't necessarily mean that we always exercise that same kind of faith. I'm sure Paul had his doubts at times. But you know what? When you actually exercise faith in God's promises, which we just got done referencing briefly, very quickly, some of those promises on the fact that you can use eternal life and honor God well, you are using the same kind of faith that Paul was using 2,000 years ago or that Peter was using 2,000 years ago or Barnabas was using 2,000 years ago or Luis. I'm sure there was a Luis back there sometime. Just trying, you know, there were a lot of guys we don't know about that they never, their names never made it in the scriptures. But they were doing things because Paul writes about some of these churches. He goes, oh, we hear about the faith of you people and we rejoice in it. And he's not talking about that you guys believed in God. It's about that you believe God's promises and it issued in love. So first of all, he says, you're my faith, uh, my child by common faith. Paul elsewhere refers to Titus as my brother. We'd say a brother in the Lord. And he refers to Titus as my co-worker. So Paul can look at him and say, you're precious to me like a child. We share a common faith. He says, you're precious to me, Titus, he tells us elsewhere, as a brother. And he tells another group of people, and Titus is precious to me as a co-worker. Somebody that links arms when we go into this together. We work together. Well, I don't know if you'd want to link arms. That would make it hard to get a job done, but you get the idea. You're both on the floor together. It's like Jim and I the other day, working on some of those stairs the other day. We're doing that, putting that stuff down. And I'm not, I'm not good. Jim shows up and I'm like, hey, Jim, I'm not good at working with other people. I'm good at taking orders from other people, but trying to say, Jim, you should do this and you should do this. This is the way we're doing this. But once I show that, Jim just, man, he's doing stuff. He got done. You know what was done? It was like, oh, ah, I'm really thankful. We were co-workers. We got some stuff done together. Well, likewise, Titus worked together with Paul. Paul worked together with Titus. Titus is not just some little guy out there that Paul says, oh, go do this. Run this errand for me. Go to 7-Eleven and get me a Slurpee or whatever you get it. You know what I'm saying? He's just not running silly errands. He's actually really literally serving alongside of Paul. Because Paul, he says in verse 5, which we already referenced, was able to send him to Crete to help take care of churches. You do that with somebody that doesn't have some know-how and some demonstrable character? No. It's somebody that you can trust to actually take care of things on that island with those churches as is necessary. All right? Right. So as we get started into this letter, Paul introduces this. I think there's things for us 
take away. Some of these things are going to they're going to be flushed out more so as we move on through some of this information about what Paul has to to tell Titus that you need to be taking care of there with those churches on the island, some of the problems that are going on, some of the things that believers need to be encouraged about. One of the best passages in the whole New Testament on how to live by grace, how grace really works. I really think it's hard to really teach how grace works if you don't have the book of Titus. And most of you already know that because we've been over that passage multiple times. But if not, we will get there eventually. There's Titus, written by the Apostle Paul, that was given charge, committed to a certain message. But that message now is something essentially that Titus needs to remember, and I think he does, but he needs to remember it because it's going to be vital for taking care of things that are not done among the churches on the island of Crete. Oh, there's Crete, by the way. I, I don't know why I put that at the end of my slides, but there it is. If you wanted to know, if you were just trying to, oh, where's Crete? I can't remember. There it is. Okay. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful. Thankful that you, uh, through the work of your spirit and through the work of others in our lives, you have and are equipping each one of us to carry out the service that you've gifted us for. Every one of us a believer has been given. Not a natural ability we were born with, but a supernatural ability that you gave us at the moment we believed the gospel. And you are equipping us through the ministry of other people so that we can be used doing a work that is designed to continue building up the body. Each and every one of us can play a role in building up the body of Christ. So we're thankful for this. We're thankful for Paul's letter to Titus, what Paul has to say about himself, but also as he's going to charge Titus with the work that's ahead of him, that he puts it in perspective of the message that you entrusted Paul with. We're thankful for this, that we can read about it. Here, 2,000 years later, these words still speak to us today. Thank you for each part of it. 